questions for reflection. In our first reading, we see the church at Jerusalem growing rapidly and the pastoral and practical needs increasing. Led by the Holy Spirit, the apostles choose to institute an order of men who will serve in the office of deacon. It would free the apostles to pursue their chief mission of prayer, preaching, and teaching. With the imposition of the hands of the apostles, seven men were ordained. While this particular passage focuses on their task of serving the needs of the widows, the following chapters present us with the witness of Stephen the deacon preaching and becoming the first martyr of the church. And then Philip the deacon opening up the book of Isaiah the prophet for the Ethiopian eunuch and leading him into the waters of baptism. So the office of deacon was a part of the early ordering of the ordained ministry within the nascent church. There are three orders in the sacrament of holy orders, bishop, priest, and deacon. Therefore, deacons are clergy in the Catholic Church, not laymen. Deacons are ordained to be an icon, an image which makes present what it reflects of Jesus the servant for the church and for the world. The Catechism of the Catholic Church citing the Bible, ancient Christian sources, and the documents of church councils explains that deacons are ordained not to the sacramental priesthood, but, quote, to the ministry. The Catechism explains it this way, and I quote, At a lower level of the hierarchy are to be found deacons who receive the imposition of hands not unto the priesthood, but unto the ministry. At an ordination to the diaconate, only the bishop lays hands on the candidate, thus signifying the deacon's special attachment to the bishop in the tasks of his diaconi. I've had the honor of serving as a deacon for 24 years. There are close to 20,000 ordained deacons in the United States alone. Do you know a deacon? Do you pray for the deacons of the church? David the Psalmist, in the words of our responsorial psalm, tells us to shout for joy and to praise and give thanks. How often do we do that? There's so much to be thankful for. Christian joy finds its root in the relationship we now have in and through Jesus Christ with the Father in the Holy Spirit. That relationship not only survives struggle, it thrives in struggle. That is, for those who have living faith. We can learn to rejoice because the Lord is always near. One of the Psalms we chant in the Liturgy of the Hours reminds us of this bedrock truth. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, saves those whose spirit is crushed. Many are the troubles of the just, but the Lord delivers from them all. Psalm 34. Christian joy is a fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit in a believer. See Galatians 5.22. It's meant to be reflected in a new way of living. It reveals the character of Christ being formed in a believer. It doesn't mean smiling all the time, though for many of us, a bit more smiling would be a good idea. <laughs> Rather, Christian joy, gospel joy, means living as though we know that Jesus never leaves us. He meant it when he said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The gospel appointed for today's mass is the Apostle John's account of Jesus calming a storm for his disciples. Sometimes we hear or read these stories and stop listening because we've heard them so often. We fail to allow the Lord to speak to us personally. St. Jose Maria Scriva encourages believers to enter into these stories, to place ourselves in the scene as one of the participants and allow the Lord to speak. In Friends of God, he wrote these words, and I quote, If you wish to get close to our Lord through the pages of the Gospels, I always recommend that you try to enter in on the scene, taking part as just one more person there. In this way, and I know many perfectly ordinary people who live this way, you will be captivated like Mary was, who hung on every word that Jesus uttered, or like Martha, who will boldly make your worries known to him, opening your heart sincerely about them all, no matter how little they may be." End quote. We can miss our encounter with the Lord if we think that the story is only about Peter and the disciples, something distant which happened over two millennia ago. The story is meant for you and me in the here and now. We live much of our daily life 
in what would be called the fourth watch of the night at the time just before daybreak, at the end of a night which seems like it will never end. We often live in waves of struggle, filled with fear and crippled as a result, unable to see the Lord on the horizon of hope. This story shows us how to overcome fear through faith, inviting us to live differently, to walk on the waters of daily life by dynamic living faith. Do we turn to the Lord in our own storms of life? We should. 